Bibles to Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah chapter 32. <clears throat> Let's just pause just for a moment of prayer. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we ask for your blessings tonight. We thank you and praise you, God, for your word, for you. And we pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, be still and know that I'm God. The invitation, the challenge, the command to stop running around like a chicken with your head cut off and sit still and know that he's God. I believe it's only then when we really, really learn the, the blessings of being still and quiet that we really hear God. We really know who he is. Being alone with him. Being quiet. Our hearts, our minds being quiet. He begins to speak. You remember over the last several weeks, I've been challenging you and asking you the question, how did God speak to Jeremiah? We find a phrase that constantly comes up, and the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying. We see it repeated over and over and over again. How did the word of God come to Jeremiah? How did he know that God was speaking to him? How do you recognize God's voice? How does God speak? Is it, how do we recognize it? Jesus said in John chapter 10, my sheep know my voice. And we recognize his voice. But how do I do that? How did Jeremiah do that? How did he know when God was speaking to him? Well, chapter 32 is kind of, kind of gives us an insight on how we can recognize the voice of God. And that's what we want to look at this evening. Well, it starts off with, and the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. So it tells us exactly when what, what was going on. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet in the 10th year of Zedekiah. Now Zedekiah only reigned for 11 years, you remember. And so he says to Jeremiah, I want you to buy a field. This is what he's going to tell him. I want you to buy the field of your cousin Hananiah. And I want you to buy this field. And, uh, and we'll get to that, but, but he tells us exactly. Now, what's happening right now? Babylon is uh, surrounded the city. Matter of fact, he'll tell us in just a second that the siege is mounting. The, 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 they're, 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 built, they're building their mounds around the city to bring in their war toys, in a sense, uh, to be able to take the city and to burn it. And, and he's describing that. He's describing the famine that they're having in the city. He describes the pestilences that they're beginning to experience, the diseases that are taking place in the city. And, he, he, and as Jeremiah has been prophesying, give up. Because you remember, Jeremiah has been telling them, to proph prophesying to him, give up. Turn yourselves in to the Babylonians. Don't fight them. Don't, uh, don't have them. They're God's instrument. And this was treason. And that's exactly what we read about here in verse 2. In the 18th year of, of Nebuchadnezzar, for then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and Jerusalem, or, excuse me, Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court 
of the prison. So Jeremiah is now in prison. Why? Well, it tells us here, which was in the uh, king of Judah's house, for Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up, saying, Why does this uh, you prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him mouth to mouth and eye to eye, face to face, basically. And he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there shall he be until I visit him, saith the Lord. Though you fight with the Chaldeans, you shall not prosper, he says. So this is what Jeremiah was saying, what he was prophesying. And we've seen it already over a couple of times. But Zedekiah has had it now. He's boxed in by the Babylonians. He's placed there, actually, he was placed there by the, the Babylonians. And what was happening is that he rebelled. He rebelled against the Babylonians, and they, are now, they have now come to take over the city and to take Zedekiah into captivity. And so they are now responding to his rebellion, Zedekiah's rebellion, and Jeremiah has been telling them, just give up. It's going to be better for you if you do. You'll live. You'll live in captivity, yes, but you'll live. If you don't, the only thing that's left for you is what? Three things. You remember? The sword, pestilence, and famine. And he said, that's the only thing that's going to happen. He said, there's going to be so many graves left in the Valley of Hinnom. There won't be enough people to bury or there won't be enough grave space to bury the people. And the birds and the fowls of the air will just come and pick away at the, the, the carcasses that are left. And so he, he, he is giving them the honest truth. But in the middle of this, now listen, in the middle of this situation, in the middle of this whole situation where, where it is evident that the children of Israel are going to be carried away into captivity. They're going to be there for 70 years. Everybody is kind of starting to resign to the fact that, yes, I, it looks like we're going to be carried away. Babylon is here. They're, they're around our city and all that. All of a sudden, God tells Jeremiah to do something that totally doesn't make any sense. And that's found in verse 6 and 7. It says, Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hanamel, the, the, the son of uh, Shalom, thy uncle, or basically your cousin, shall come unto you, saying, By my field that, it, uh, that is in Antheon, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. Now, he's in jail. <laughs> he's locked up. he got a lot of time to think there. And uh, all of a sudden, a thought comes into his mind that his cousin's going to come by and offer this field that's in Bethlehem area to buy, redeem it. Now let's back up just a second here and, and talk about this, this, this redemption thing, uh, buying the field. In the land of Israel, you remember when the children of Israel came into the land, Joshua divided up the land according to the families that came into the land. Every family received a portion of land. And they were to keep that land. They weren't to sell it. They weren't to, to just frivolously give it away. It was their inheritance from the Lord. And uh, matter of fact, it was such a strong thing. You remember when Naboth was asked by King Ahab to sell his field. Naboth says, no, this is, this is my family inheritance. I couldn't do that. I couldn't sell you the, the field, Ahab. And you remember Ahab through a whole conspiracy and killed Naboth for that vineyard that he owned. But it was something that you would not want to depart with. But there were times where 
you had to depart from it because of debt, because of some issue in your life. You had to sell that field to get out of debt or you went into slavery or something like that. And you would uh, lose the right of that field. Well, after six years and on the seventh year, that field came up for sale for you or your family. That is that 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 field was now able to be repurchased. You had first bid. It came up automatically in a sense. And you were able now to, to buy that field back. And if you couldn't, the, uh, the closest kinsman, first of all, maybe a brother, or if not that, a cousin, would step up and say, I'll buy the field or whatever. And they would purchase the field. And then it would remain in the family's name so that the name of your family would remain in Israel, the, in, in, the inheritance of it. Very important. Well, this cousin of Jeremiah realizes, well, we're, it looks like we're going to be leaving. Matter of fact, Bethlehem is already besieged. Bethlehem's already, already taken. The field's already occupied by, by the Babylonians. And he comes to Jeremiah and he says, why don't you buy my field? Why don't you redeem it? And I don't know if it was something that was a really honest thing that, that Jeremiah's cousin was trying to get across or whatever. But it would sure appears as though he's just trying to get a little money before he goes into captivity. And he's trying to make a deal or something here. But... Jeremiah is getting this, this impression before it ever happens. And I imagine Jeremiah saying, why would I want to do that? Why would God lay this on my heart to do something like that? It just doesn't make sense. But then the next verse tells us, that Hamiel came, his, his cousin came to me in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord and said unto me, buy my field. I pray thee, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thy sake. Then I knew, it says, then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. He says, then I knew. He's there in prison thinking, wow, why am I thinking about that? Why do I think that that was going to happen? Why do I think that this person is going to approach me and, and, and offer me this? Is that the Lord? Well, Jeremiah says that when it was confirmed by the actual event, his cousin coming to him and saying, buy the field. It's yours to, to, to redeem. Buy it. He said then, I knew it was the Lord. Interesting. It was confirmed. It, it, it actually happened. How many of you have ever had an impression that you think, well, that's interesting, you know, and, and, and it's something there. Then all of a sudden, it happens. The event comes to pass. The opportunity arises. Um, the person comes to you and, and, and is in, standing in front of you or whatever. Uh, is it just coincidence? Or is it could be the word of the Lord? I think a lot of times we miss the opportunities that God wants to give us in speaking to us, preparing us for time with certain things, certain events or circumstances that we just think, oh, it's just coincidence, or it's just, it's just something that I'm thinking of. It's a wish, rather than actually the will of God. How does God speak to you? How does God speak to us? I believe that he speaks to us. I really do. Um, I'll never forget a story that Ch Pastor Chuck told just recently. Um, a few years ago, he went to China... Uh, as it, it speaking uh, 
there. The government had invited him to come and speak to the churches and stuff like that. And he had, he had met some people over there, some Christians. And uh, they were telling his story, their, their story, to Pastor Chuck. And I thought it was very interesting. The story goes like this, that, that this family in North Korea, when the war broke out in the, in the uh, 50s, um, they began, the war was going, and they knew that the war was ending. They were going to be, they, that, that North and South Korea was going to be formed, and, and, and they were going to have this, uh, uh, this line that, that separated North and South. Korea. And this one man took his wife and his, his children and he said, you go, just go south and you stay there and, uh, and I'll get there later on. Well, later on never happened. They were separated up until just a few years ago. And how it happened was this. She had been praying over and over and over and over again, Lord, I want to know where my husband's at. Just let me know if he's alive or if he's, if he's uh, in prison or whatever. Let me know what's happening. And they told the story that in the night where she was praying, the Lord just began to give her numbers. And she took these numbers and she called them on telephone and it was the area code of China and she called the number and a voice picked up the phone and it was a man's voice and she says is this so and so he said well yes it is and she says were you in Korea did you have a wife did you and he goes who are you and how do you know this now, he's a high-ranking official in the Chinese government today. And it's her husband. And the Lord just put together this family. And Chuck was telling the story of, of this whole thing, that how it came about, and they are reunited now. But he says, you cannot tell me that God doesn't speak to us. Now, that's a, that's a, that's a, a, a fantastic story. But as we'll get down later on, is there any too, anything too hard for God? Is there anything too hard for him? You know, we think of that, that nah, no, I don't think so. Yeah, it can't happen. But that's because we've got a small God or a small concept of God. Is there, too, is there anything too hard for him? Now, Jeremiah asked that question as he'll in, in just a second. But here he's told, by the field, and then the offer comes, and he says, by the field. And so he says, I knew it was the voice of God. I knew it was God telling me to do so. Um, there are ways that God reveals his will and his voice to us or whatever, at times his, his desires for us. Sometimes you just receive revelations. Remember Peter? Who do men say that I am? He says, you're the Christ, son of the living God. He said, well, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter, but my Father which is in heaven you, you've received a revelation. That's a divine revelation. You couldn't have come up with that on your own, Peter. But God gave that to you. And God speaks to us through revelations, things that he just reveals to us. And, and we, we, wow, and we see it and know it. Samuel, God spoke to Samuel in an audible voice. Now, I've never heard an audible voice from God. Sometimes I wish I would. But then there's other times where I wish I wouldn't. You know, I said, no, don't, don't scare me like that. You know, and, but, but I, 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 <laughs> I think that would be kind of neat. Samuel, you remember when he was a young boy? 
He's laying down in bed one night. The voice says, Samuel. And he goes, oh. So he gets up and he runs to the high priest, Eli. And he says, Eli, wh- wh- what do you want? Were you calling me? And he says, no, I wasn't calling you. Go back to bed. He lays back down and the voice goes, Samuel. He goes, oh, you know, he runs back in there to Eli. Eli, did you call me? He goes, I didn't call you, Samuel. Go back to bed. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you hear that again, you just lay there in bed and you say, speak, Lord, I'm listening. And so Samuel went back into his bedroom and laid down. And as he was laying there, it says, Samuel. And he goes, speak, Lord, I'm, I'm listening. And God began to speak to Samuel about what he was going to do with Eli and his sons. And God began to speak to him. Audible voice. Now, I've never had the privilege of hearing God speak. I've, you know, somebody just out in the open and just say, boom, you know. It'd be kind of neat, though. I, I definitely would listen. God would, God has spoke to spoke in past times through angels. Uh, We see in in the New Testament all the time, angels coming. In the Old Testament, the same way with with Daniel. Angels showing up, speaking, giving messages and things like that. Um, Circumstances could be another way where God reveals his, his will and speaks to you. I think of Jacob. Here's Jacob. He made a bargain with God many years before, and he says, God, uh, if you bless me and bring me back to this land, I'll, you know, you can be my God. <laughs> and, uh, and so he is there some 20 years now in, in with his father, or father-in-law Laban, and he is being, he's prospered. He has four wives and a lot of kids, whole nation with him. And and he's got all these herds, you know, goats and sheep and cattle, and he's got all this stuff now. And, uh, And it says there in the book of Genesis that all of a sudden, the countenance of his brother in laws changed towards him. Well, that's a, that's a big situation change here. They loved to have him around because they were prospering too when Jacob was around. But all of a sudden, the circumstances in Jacob's life, around Jacob's life, and in Jacob's life begin to change. And all of a sudden, he realized God's doing something here. God's changing things for me. And so all of a sudden... God began to move on Jacob to pick up his family and move. And you read the story. But it was because of that circumstances of his brother-in-laws and his father-in-law that caused him to want to move. And a lot of times God uses circumstances to kind of make us look upward and say, God, is it time to move? Is it time to go? Is it time to do this or do that? And so he changes. He speaks to us through circumstances. There are other times where God just totally and absolutely directly talked and intervened. He just he just showed up on the scene. Elijah. Remember, Elijah calls fire down from heaven, runs down there to Samaria. And then the message comes to him from Jezebel and says, you're going to die. God do to me. The same thing that you did to those prophets, if I haven't done the same thing to you that you did to my prophets <laughs> by tomorrow. And Joshua, I mean, uh, Elijah was petrified of this woman. Just killed 450 priests, men, but he couldn't stand up to this one woman. And he hightails it south. And he's running toward Mount Sinai. And he wants to get to God. And when he gets up there in his cave, He's hiding out. And God says, comes to him and says, Elijah, 
what are you doing here? He said, well, you're about out of business, God. I'm the only one left. He's killed all your prophets, and now they're seeking to kill me. And uh, you, you've had it, you know. And, uh, and God says, Elijah, don't you realize, I've got thousands more just like you. You're not alone. And he says, well, you know, and he, he cooks them, has a cake made for him and stuff like that. And, and, and sends them, recommissions them back into, into, into ministry. But that's the way God spoke and, and, and all that. Now, he speaks through visions and dreams. Now, I've never had a vision, but I've had dreams. Your old men shall dream dreams. And, you know, that's it, man. And, uh, and, and your young men shall dream, see visions. But, but, uh, but, you know, your old men shall dream dreams, as the Bible says. And, and so I see, I see, uh, I, I've had some dreams that I know specifically they're from the Lord. And there are, they have been so accurate in my life and in the, this church's life that I've watched God just fulfill them. And is fulfilling them. And it's just amazing. It's something that you know it's not the pizza, it's not the Taco Bell pizza mixture that you had at, at dinner that night or something, you know. And, and so you know that it's, it, it's definitely of God. God is speaking to you. It's so clear. So God speaks to us through visions and dreams, but... It says in Hebrews chapter 1, God in many times and in any many places, he spoke to us through prophets and, 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 and visions and everything else like that. But in these last days, God has spoken to us through Jesus. And God speaks to us, I believe, more pers precisionly, I guess, through his word. This book that you have in your hand, has an answer for you in every area of your life. Do you realize that? Do you realize that, that if you'll just spend time with it, it will give you applications for your daily life, every single day of your life. And, and, and it's just so clear. So God speaks to us. Now, now he, God asks him to do something totally strange, to, totally weird. They're going into captivity, but he says, by the field. Now, now, God asks Christians to do certain things really strange today, too. I was thinking about this, this today. You know, there are things that, that we do as Christians that are kind of strange to the world. Have you ever thought about that? Um, marriage is one, one area. You know, the world isn't really into marriage that much. Divorce rates, a little bit over 50%. Um, it's not really, uh, actually, there's, they, they say there's just as many people living together today in the United States as there are married. Now, that means uh, they're counting us as Christians in that pot, too. And so there could be possibly more people, uh, non-Christians, living together than there are married. When you think about it. But they don't look at marriage like, what would you want to do that for, thing for? I've heard in, in marriage counseling, people tell me quite often that their parents or their friends will tell them, well, why don't you guys just live together? You know, or they, they look at you and they, well, if you're going to get married, why don't you make sure you got a good lawyer to give you a good contract so when this thing dissolves, uh, you, you're able to make sure you walk away with your money. Um, I, I know couples in this church right now that, 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 that I've married that, that have told me, yeah, oh, yeah, my boss told me, hey, here's my lawyer's name and, and, and phone number, and you, I've, I've got an appointment for you. If you'll just go and see him, he'll set up a prenuptial agreement where you, you, won't, uh, you won't lose a thing when you get married. 
And, and she said, no thanks, man. That's, I'm not planning on getting divorced. And then look at you. Well, no, come on. Everybody says that. But we know everything happens like that. And, and, and they, they have this attitude. And God asks us to do that. Why? Well, because God asks us to, to stand before a minister and make a commitment and, and bind it with a contract about marriage. And we do things that are kind of weird. We, we raise families. And we raise families for Jesus. And we bring up kids to know the Lord and, and to serve the Lord. Matter of fact, we even will leave this life of comfort and ease and go into a foreign field and become a missionary somewhere and maybe even give our lives up. We do strange things. God asks us to do strange things at times in the sight of the world. And it was no different than for Jeremiah to, to be asked to buy this field at this time than, than maybe God saying, hey, why don't you go to the mission field? <clears throat> now, I'm, I'm not saying any one of you, but if any one of you want to go to the mission field, praise God. But, I mean, if, if God lays it on, go for it. But I'm not suggesting anything. No, I'm not. But, uh, but here, he's, he's saying that here, you know, it's just weird. And so why do we do it? Well, because we have faith in God's word. His faith in his promises. And, and, you know, that's what faith is all about, is just trusting God, obeying God. It, it's, I, I found a, a quote. Obeying God is, is, is really um, <clears throat> what faith is all about, is obeying God in spite of what we see, how we feel, and what may happen. It's been well said, faith is not believing in spite of evidence, but obeying in spite of consequences. I think that's good. Something to hang on. And so God says to him, buy the field. Well, he bought the field. It says in verse, 39, or verse 9, and he says he bought it for 17 shekels of silver, and he signed the deed and sealed it and took witness. He grabbed these witnesses. He had probably basically probably a couple of inmates or, or maybe some jail keepers there for witnesses. And, and so he, 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 gets, he gets the deed, it says in verse 11. So I took the deed of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, that which was open, and I gave the deed of the purchase to Barak, the son of this man, in, in the sight of Hamiel, my cousin. And he says, in the presence of these witnesses that signed the deed of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. So in front of all these people, Jeremiah makes and seals this, this contract. And he uses a faithful servant of his, which God blesses in the end. We'll, we'll get to know him more and more as we go on. But it says that he charged him to take both copies now of the agreement and put them in clay jars and bury them. He says in verse 14, he says, take them, seal them, seal the deeds and, uh, that is open and put them in, the, in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days. Why? Because they're going to be captive. They're going to be, uh, they're going to be basically um, out of the country. And so he says, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. And God says, the reason why I want you, Jeremiah, to do this is because the children of Israel are going to come back into this land. And this was a symbol to them, a message to them, one of those action sermons that Jeremiah so frequently gave, you know, uh, in, in his ministry, 
that you're coming back. You're going to buy more land. You're going to come back and, and inherit your land again. It was a message to them. That even though God is going to take them out, God is going to make them come, cause them to return. And so it was a message of, 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 of hope, actually. But now he says this. Now, Jeremiah buys the field. How many has ever bought anything and then you have buyer's remorse after you get it? You know? <laughs> That's exactly what we read here. Um, Jeremiah says, Lord, why did you let me do that? You know, I spent 17 shekels for this. You know? And he's, he's upset. 17 silver shekels, that's a lot of money. And he's, he's kind of he's upset about it. He says, Lord. And, and, and he's, he's kind of upset. Now, he realizes there's 70 years of captivity going to happen. He's not going to be alive in 70 years. Jeremiah is never going to be able to live in that land that he just purchased from his cousin. And he's wondering, why? Why would you want me to waste 17? Maybe, maybe his cousin walked away thinking, ha. I got some money now. I can buy my way out of this or whatever. Who knows what the circumstances are. But he's starting to feel buyer's remorse. He's starting to feel like I've been took. Maybe I, this was just not the right thing. Did I really hear God clearly? And, and so, so he says, now when I had delivered the deed of the purchase, I prayed unto the Lord saying, ah, Lord God, Behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and an outstretched arm. And there is nothing too hard for thee. I like that. He says, and, and it's kind of a, as he's saying, it, he's kind of like, there, there isn't anything too hard for you, right? Because <laughs> that's how he ends the prayer in a few more verses. And this is Jeremiah's prayer. And notice what he, how he approaches God. He's kind of worried about what he just did. And so he starts talking to God, and he goes, first of all, he says, Lord, you've, you created everything. Notice what he's doing. God, you created everything with just your hand. You, you stretched out everything with your hand. And, and now, God, he says, there's nothing too hard for you. And, and he says, you've... You've shown even loving kindness unto thousands and recompensed the iniquities of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great and mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. I mean, God, you've been merciful to thousands, but you've judged many others too. You've been a just God. You've been a fair God. You've been a merciful and loving, kind God to all of us. And he says, great is your counsel and mighty is your works. For thy eyes are open unto all the ways of the sons of men to give every uh, one according to his ways and according to the fruits of his doing. Who has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt? He starts to remember the past, how God uh, acted in the days of the, of the exodus. And even this day in, the land, in, in Israel and among other men and have made thee a name at this day. I mean, here, here's Babylon outside. And, and he says, and has given them this land. I mean, God, you've given, you brought them out of Egypt with his, a mighty hand, with a strong hand. And he says, and, he, and you've given them this land, which thou did swear to their fathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. And he says, he says, and they came in and they possessed it. God, you promised it and it was done. It was finished. It was, here we are. But they obeyed not your voice, neither walked in the law. They have done nothing of all that commanded them, that you commanded them to do. Therefore, thou, thou hast caused all this evil to come upon us. And behold the surge mount. I mean, here, 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 here the Babylonians are outside and they're mounting their siege upon us. They are coming unto the city to take it. And the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans 
that fight against it because of the sword and because of the famine and the pestilence. And what thou hast spoken has come to pass. And behold, thou seest it. God, you've been right all the way down the line. But then notice what he says. And thou hast said, but then you said unto me, <laughs> Lord God, buy the field with the money and take witnesses, for the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans. God, what is going on here? You've done all these great and mighty things. You've been right up to this point, and, but now. <laughs> you ever prayed that way? God, you've been perfect up to this point. You know, everything has just gone perfectly until right now. That's what Jeremiah is kind of feeling. Now, Jeremiah has had these feelings in the past. We've talked about them. And he's, he's, he has just been, uh, uh, you know, he, he's the kind of guy. But, but notice what he does. He, he, in, in his prayer life, he gets everything in perspective first. He gets it. He gets his problem, his needs, and he gets them next to God. You know, when you get your needs next to God, they don't look as great or as big or as powerful. And so that's what he does. He first of all recognizes who God is. Lord, you've created everything. And he says, he says here, you've created all of it. And there is nothing too hard for you. And God says this back to him. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. And there is, there is, is there anything too hard for me? Jeremiah, is there? Is there anything too hard for me? You know, Jeremiah says, he, he kind of says, there, there's, there's nothing too hard for you to do, right, God? Right? And God says, well, Jeremiah, is there anything too hard for me to do? And Jeremiah realizes, no, there isn't. He realizes it. How many, do you guys know that, that that's true in your life tonight? But when, we're, when we got problems, when we were in a situation, we have a struggle with that, don't we? I mean, really, when you, when you really get down to it, when there's things happening, when, the, when, when, when the, the furnace is heated up seven times hotter, what do we do? We start thinking, oh, wait a minute, God. We have this idea of God about, about that big then, you know, sometimes. And we think, oh, my gosh, you know. Lord, you know, and, and God says, I'm still here. And God wants me to turn and face him in prayer and say, Lord, I know who you are. You haven't changed. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're the same God that saved me back here, that the same God that's saving me today and will save me ultimately in heaven. Lord, you're the same God. And so... I've got to say, there isn't anything too hard for you. And so you begin to put it in focus. Put the need that you have in focus. Notice, you remember when the, um, when the apostles, remember what happened to them when they got beat for their, their, uh, their bold speech and preaching for Jesus Christ. And they were warned and threatened, don't preach in this name ever again. Remember what they did? They went back to the rest of the assembly and they got together as a church and they began to pray. You remember that? And in chapter 4 of Acts, it tells us that we, he, they started to pray and what did they say? They said, God, you've created everything. You're the God of all heaven and earth. There's nothing too hard for you to do that basically what they're saying. They're, and, and then they said this, now, behold, they're threatening and grant us boldness to speak in your name. Remember that? And the place was shaken. And God blessed them. 
And we, as children of God, should be just that bold. If in the face of difficulties, in face of doubts and everything, go back to God and say, God, behold what they're saying. Behold what is going on. Behold what is doing this. And then say, Lord, give me boldness to face it. Give me the courage to face it. Give me the necessity that I need, the things that I need to face it. Lord, show me what I must do. And face it. Give me the wisdom. James says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And God will give you the wisdom. And here, Jeremiah is praying, Lord, have I done anything? Have I done it? Did I hear you right? And God says, yes. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will give the city into the hand of the Chaldeans and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And the Chaldeans that fight against the city shall come and set fire to, the, to this city and burn it with the houses upon whose roofs they have offered incense unto Baal and pour out drink offerings unto the gods to provoke me to anger. I mean, they did. I mean, you can go, I was telling, um, who was I talking to in this evening before the service? We were talking about uh, this whole situation um, and how in Israel they have the seal of uh, Barak in, in, in Israel. They found his house. They found his seal that sealed this, this, this deed here for Jeremiah. They, they found all the places where Nebuchadnezzar burned there in the city of Ophel, south of, of the Temple Mount, what we call the city of David. And those things are now in the museum in Jerusalem. And you can go there and, and see these little gods that they had, pornographic gods that they had, that they worshipped. And, and, and they, uh, we go there, and, and we, we went this last time. Actually, it was the first time we've ever went to this one museum. We've been to everything else around in, that, in the museum area. But this time we had a little bit more time and we were able to go there. And it was unbelievable. I mean, the more we, farther we got into the museum, the more excited we got because we started to see some things that you just turn your Bible and read about it and say, my gosh, that's it. You know, and, and here it is. And, and, and so here these gods are. And they, they, we, we can see them today, but they were actually worshiping and they were provoking God to anger in verse 29. And verse 30, it says, For the children of Israel and the children of Judah have, have only done evil before me from their youth. And the children of Israel have only provoked me to anger with the work of their hands, saith the Lord. For this city has been to me a, a provocation of anger and of my fury from the, from the day that they built it, even unto this day that I should remove it from before their face. I mean, for over the last 200 and some years, they have been provoking me. Ever since Solomon took it over and built the city, it's been provoking me. And God, you remember one place God says, it was never in my mind that you would offer up sacrifices like you do. I never could conceive of you doing things like you did. And, and he throws this, this, this ideal out that, that it's just an abomination to him. Well, he goes on to say, because of all the evil of the children of Israel... And the children of Judah, which they have done to the kings, their princes, their priests, and their prophets, and the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and they have turned unto me their backs, not their faces, he says. Instead of coming to me, they turned from me. And he goes on, he says, though I taught them rising up early and teaching them. What is he referring to here? The prophets that he would send in the, uh, to them. The prophets would be out there first thing in the mornings. They would be up before everybody else and they would be out there meeting the people, speaking to them, calling them back to repentance. But they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't listen. God did this every day for them. And but they, sent the, they set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name to defile it. 
and they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the sons of Hinnom, to ca cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fires of Molech, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Jerusalem, uh, Judah to sin. It never came into my mind, he says. And now, therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city of which it, uh, you say, it shall be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence, and behold, I will gather them out of the countries to which I have uh, driven them to in my anger and in my fury and in great wrath. And I will bring them again unto this place. And I will cause them to dwell safely. Uh, again, <laughs> just the grace of God here. He says, I'm driving you out, but I'm going to bring you back. <laughs> you know, just in the same breath, the mercy of God. I'm going to kick you out, but I'm going to bring you back in. It's just like, you know, there were so many times in my life where Andrew would do something, where I would get upset with him. And I'd go after him, you know, and he'd give me this look or whatever, and then I'd start laughing. And I'd just, I'd, I'd, I'd just go, well, right, you know. And I'd, I'd want, you know, and Diane, she'd go, oh, yeah blew it again with them, you know. She'd say, you can't do that. You can't sit there and laugh with them. You know, and, 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 and I knew that. But that's kind of like God does with us. He, I'm going to spank you, but I'm going to love you. You know. Now, trust me, Andrew gets the spanking. He just got one last week, you know, and all that. <laughs> no, he didn't. <clears throat> no. But, um, <laughs> yeah, right. My hand like this, you know, you know. Well, he says, he goes on and he says, but I'm going to bring you back. And they shall be my people and I will be their God, he says. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them, he says and of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And I will not turn again from doing them good. See, God's saying, the reason I'm doing this is for their good. He's not doing it because he's angry with them and he hates them and he doesn't want to ever see them again. He's doing it because he, it's for their good. Just like when we do discipline our children, we do it for their good. We do it because we want them to learn how to respect things and respect people and respect authority. And God says, I've got to teach you these things. And so he, so he disciplines them, but he says, I'm doing it for their own good, and I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Yea, and I will rejoice over them in doing, in doing them good, and I will plant them in the land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. For thus saith the Lord, as I have brought all this great evil upon this people, so will I bring upon them all the good that I have promised them. I mean, God says, just as sure as I brought the Babylonians because I told them I would, now I'm going to tell them I'm going to bring all this good to them. And fields shall be brought in this land, bought in this, in this land, of which you say, it is desolate without man or beast. It is given unto the hand of the Chaldeans. Men shall buy fields for money and sign deeds and seal them and take witness in the land of, of Benjamin and in the places about Jerusalem and in the cities of Judah and in the cities of the mountains and in the cities of the plains and in the cities of the, of the, of the Negev or the desert area. For I will cause their captivity to return, saith the Lord. And so God just says, you know what? They're going to come back, and they're going to be reestablished in their land. And they were, and they are, and they still are. It's just unbelievable. And God's just planting them in the land. And they're buying their land. And they're tilling their land. They're growing their land. You know, and God's keeping his promise to the nation of Israel. I, I, it's just amazing. 
Church, would you pray, keep praying for the nation of Israel. Pray for the people in Israel. That God would open their eyes. That the church of Jesus Christ in Israel would grow and be strengthened. Especially right now. Especially right now. That there would be such a boldness in their witness to the, the lost in Israel. Pray for the, the Arabic churches that love Jesus Christ there in Israel. That they would be bold with their Arab brothers in sharing the love of Jesus Christ. I mean, they are in unbelievable times right now. And we need to be in prayer for them. But God says, as surely as I did all this to you, as surely I'm going to do this to you, for you. Just like God says, as surely as I'd done this, I sent my only begotten son into this world to die for you and to raise him from the dead and to glorify him in heaven. As surely as I've done this, I will also do this, come back for you and take you with me. And there you're going to be with me forever and ever and ever and ever. I mean, God's promises are sure. God's, God's past promises are his pro is, is just the proof of his future promises. So when I see the word of God like this and I say, well, that God did it. That tells me God's going to do it. Whatever is not left it, it, it is still undone in prophecies. God's going to finish it. Every prophecy will be fulfilled when he comes back. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we ask that, God, you would bless as we just are reminded that you do speak to us. Let us be reminded, Lord, that there is not one thing too hard for you. Lord, thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.